Well, hello and welcome back to Soteriology. In the last class, we looked at the Calvinist system as it developed from John Calvin and became official doctrine in the Canons of Dort in the year 1619, about a hundred years after the Reformation began in Germany. My goal there was to show how the Calvinist system really fits into one unified system. And today I want to look at the first real direct challenge to the Calvinist system. The champion of the Calvinist system after John Calvin was Theodore Beza. Theodore Beza had been a student of Calvin and he carries on the Calvinist system and systematizes it even more than Calvin had. Now in the Netherlands, a Dutch man named Jacob Arminius was interested in Calvinism, and he was such a good student that he went down to France to study in Geneva under Theodore Beza. And so Jacob Arminius studied under Beza and then went back to the Netherlands. And it was there as he pastored in the Netherlands that he became worried about certain emphases in Calvinism. Unfortunately, he died at the age of 49 in the year 1609. And so Jacob Arminius was not really around for the Articles of Remonstrance, which would be developed by his followers a year later. We can't be absolutely sure then that Jacob Arminius would have said everything that's put forth in the five articles of remonstrance. But it is these articles that call for response by others in the Reformed community and in 1618 and 1619 then the Synod of Dort is called to respond to Jacob Arminius and these five articles of remonstrance are met by the five points of Calvinism. For the Arminian tradition developed in 1610 the articles are first of all conditional election. God elects based on foreknowledge not based on his predetermined choice. Second, the unlimited atonement for all individuals. Christ's death makes salvation possible for all human beings. Third is total depravity, and I put in parentheses a mild form of total depravity, because as we'll see, it weakens the account of total depravity set forth by the Calvinists in very important ways. The fourth article is prevenient grace, and here, Arminians are arguing that prevenient grace is necessary for salvation, but it's not irresistible in salvation. And finally, conditional preservation of the saints. Their claim is that a person may have that real faith and then lose that real faith, and that may be why they don't persevere to the end. It's these points that we want to examine today in order to understand the trajectory of the Arminian position. Now, primarily today, I'm going to be using two books that put the Calvinist tradition and the Arminian tradition next to each other and compare them. Michael Horton's For Calvinism and Roger Olson's book Against Calvinism. It's a lively debate and I would encourage you to read both books carefully in order to see their major arguments as they're developed. Let's start with Article 3, which they call Total Depravity, because it matches up with the T in Calvinism, Total Depravity. And what we see is that they're trying to make absolutely clear that they're not Pelagian and they're not semi-Pelagian that man does not possess saving grace of himself, nor of the energy of his free will. By himself, he can't think, will, or do anything that is truly good. And so, God's grace must work before a human being can do anything good. And so, it absolutely necessary is God's grace in salvation. But then notice that God's grace and the Holy Spirit renews the person in understanding, inclination, and will in all their faculties in order that he may rightly understand, will, and affect what is truly good. Now that is a step forward, and what they're getting at are two very important points here. First of all, whereas for the Calvinist, concupiscence is always a sin, 
that is, everything I'm doing at all times is a matter of sin. For the Arminians, concupiscence is not sin. Concupiscence is a downward tendency, but it's not in itself sin. And Wesley will be clear that one can reach a level of total perfection in one's lifetime. Not that one is completely emptied of all sin, but that one can live rightly before God in all their actions. So they're weakening in a substantial way this Calvinist understanding of total depravity. A second point is that the will is lifted up to a state of neutrality. That is, what grace does is not accomplish salvation, it's not irresistible, but rather grace lifts the will to a level where the individual can choose for or against God. The individual must make that choice. It's a cooperative choice with grace. God has to ask our permission in order for us to be saved. And here again, this is a substantial difference from the Calvinist model, where the emphasis is always on a person being dead and then made fully alive without their will being involved. We go back then to Article 1, which is conditional election corresponds to the second point of Calvinism, unconditional election. And the emphasis here is that God has determined out of the fallen sinful race of men to save in Christ those who through the grace of the Holy Spirit shall believe on his son Jesus and shall persevere in this faith and obedience of faith through this grace even to the end. That is, that the way election takes place is that God looks ahead in time and he sees which persons will cooperate with his grace and those are the ones that he elects to be saved. So election is a consequence of foreknowledge. It's not a predestining ordination of a person's salvation, but rather a response to the individual's choice of God. Now this quite substantially changes the very nature of faith. Because for Calvinists, faith is always a gift given by God. When I am completely passive with the Arminians, faith is a condition for election. I must have faith that is by grace. God gives me that gift of faith, but then I must exercise it myself actively on my part and not simply passively in order for salvation to occur. We need to notice here that there is more than one way to articulate a doctrine of election. As Michael Horton says, well, everyone who takes the Bible seriously must believe in election in some sense. It's a prominent theme throughout scripture. It's impossible to read the Bible without recognizing God's freedom to choose some and not others. For both, there is an emphasis on corporate election. And here we need to recognize this category of corporate election to see what both sides disagree on. Certainly in the Bible, many, many places where election is talked about, it is a corporate kind of election. God chooses Israel. He chose Jacob instead of Esau. God chooses Christ on our behalf. God chooses the church to be his instrument where he chose Israel in the Old Testament. It's the church in the New Testament. And God chooses persons. And the question is, though, does God choose each individual person or does God choose entities that he works with, say Israel, the church, and human beings themselves choose? whether they want to be part of that entity that, with which God is working. And here's the difference between Arminians and Calvinists. Arminians will emphasize that God chooses the church as the means to salvation, and then individuals decide whether they want to be part of the church. God has elected us in Christ, but we choose whether we want to be part of Christ. Whereas the Reformed would say, well, if God chooses entities, then God also chooses individuals. Election extends all the way to individual human beings being selected for salvation or passed over for damnation. Let's see then how Calvinists and Arminians would read differently certain central passages on the doctrine of election. Ephesians chapter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him. 
He destined us for adoption as his children through Christ Jesus. The Arminian would emphasize that corporate election is what's in view here. He chose us in Christ. He destined us for adoption as children through Christ Jesus. In Christ, we obtain an inheritance. And always the emphasis here is on Christ. That's corporate election, they say. This text is not saying anything about my selection by God in eternity past based on his own will, but rather it's saying that God chose Christ from all eternity past, and now I have the responsibility to be in Christ if I'm to be saved. Calvinists will read this and say he chose us in Christ, and their emphasis is on each one of us being chosen in Christ. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance. And so their emphasis would be that each individual is also chosen in Christ. Or we could look at the difference in this key text in Romans chapter 8. And we know that all things God works for the good of those who love him, to those who have been called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And whoever he predestined, he called, and those he called, he justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. Now, the question is, does the word foreknow mean something like predestined, or does it mean something different than predestined? The Reformed here would say that the word foreknow means God has set his heart upon in a special way. They would claim that the word to know often in the Bible means an intimate kind of knowing or a loving, a special covenant bond, they might say. And so foreknowledge is an aspect of election. God foreknew before any individual could make a choice, and then God predestined those. On the other hand, the Arminian argument would be that foreknowledge here is very clearly God looked ahead and saw which persons would have faith. And then it's those individuals that he predestined. Now, the Reformed would argue that all whom God foreknew, he also predestined, and he called, and he justified, and he glorified. So anyone who is involved in God's foreknowledge is also saved and eventually glorified. The Arminians, of course, would respond that, of course, God foresaw that they would accept him, and so he predestined them, and then he went ahead and called them, and justified them, and glorified them. The second article is on unlimited atonement, and here the Arminians claim to be in continuity with the entire church in every part except for the Calvinists. And they would claim that Christ, the Savior, is the Savior of the world, and he died for all men and for every man, so that he has obtained for them all redemption and the forgiveness of sins. And yet, that no one actually enjoys this forgiveness of sins except the believer. So Christ's death is effective for all persons, but it does not save any person until the individual in faith receives Christ and embraces that salvation. Now, Arminians will argue here that limited atonement is an aberration in Christian tradition. Universal atonement was clearly taught in the early fathers, and it was, seems to be taught all the way through the church, from Augustine all the way up through Calvin, who did not seem to himself take a doctrine of limited atonement, and therefore they would say it's simply scholastic Calvinism that takes this position, and it's not faithful to the larger Christian tradition. Secondly, limited atonement contradicts the love of God, they would say, because God, if he only saved some, is hateful toward others. Why would he create human beings for whom he did not die and therefore allow them to go to hell? How could this possibly be love? What kind of a particular love would this be in which love, God's love is announced to the world and yet Christ's saving work is only for certain individuals and necessarily leaves others without his saving work? And one might ask, how could we share the gospel? Claiming to the individual that Jesus died for you, could one even say that anymore? 
there are a number of scriptural arguments that one could make to question the legitimacy of limited atonement at least. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, that's Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. God doesn't want any to perish, but he wants all to come to repentance. Impossible to say if Christ's atonement were only for certain individuals. Christ is the Savior of all persons, especially those who believe. And God so loved the world that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So it seems that scripture is full of evidence that Christ's atonement extends to all. Of course, Calvinists will often respond and say all doesn't necessarily mean every single individual. It could certainly mean all kinds of persons. And in 1 John 2, 2, not for our sins, but only, but also for the sins of the whole world might mean other people groups in the world who are elected to be saved. Even John Piper, whom we looked at last time, defending the five points of Calvinism, will admit that Christ's death is for all in some sense. In what sense? Well, 1 Timothy 4.10, Christ is the Savior of all, especially those who believe. Or John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Piper would say the sending of the son is for the whole world in the sense that the gospel goes out to the whole world. There's a call of the gospel that's extended to all. It's simply that only some will come because only some have been elected and only some have then had the work of Christ applied to them. The fourth article is that grace is resistible rather than irresistible. Now this follows from Christ lifting our will to the point where we can choose and then requiring that cooperative grace be involved, that we cooperate with the grace that he gives. And so they emphasize all goods and good deeds or movements that can be conceived must be ascribed to the grace of God because it's the grace of God that makes it possible for us to be saved and it's always his grace working in us when we are saved. But yet it's our choice and our authentic choice that's involved moved by him. And so grace cannot be irresistible because it's perfectly obvious, they say from the Bible, that many persons have resisted the grace of God. Now what they're trying to emphasize here is that nothing good can be done without grace. A person can't do anything good before God on their own. But at the second point, they are emphasizing that all persons must cooperate with grace. Grace doesn't work on purely passive agents. It moves a person from passive to active, and then it requires that a person be involved in that active process. From salvation to the continuation of salvation, all the way to glorification. Finally, the fifth article, they want to affirm that all human beings who become Christians have assurance and security in their life, but yet they could fall away by their own choice. And so they claim that those who are incorporated into Christ by true faith and have thereby become partakers of his life-giving spirit, as a result, have full power to strive against Satan. Being well understood that it is ever through the assisting grace of the Holy Spirit and that Jesus Christ assists them through his spirit in all temptations. And so it's always the Holy Spirit working in me, giving me the power to persevere. And Christ works in my life to allow me to persevere. And yet, whether they are capable through negligence of forsaking again the first beginning of their Christian life, or again, returning to this present evil world of turning away from the holy doctrine which was delivered to them, that must be more particularly determined out of holy scripture before we can teach it with a full confidence of mind. Notice they're not making a decision here. Is it possible for a person to fall away? They say we want to allow that to be a possibility. They're not making a decision. And they're not claiming that a person can lose their salvation in this or that case. But rather they're saying we want to keep this an open possibility because scripture read plainly seems to make it an open possibility.
they're noticing here, the same verses that the Calvinists are noticing, that faith must endure to the end in order to be saving faith. Paul says, examine yourselves if you hold fast to the word I preach to you. Unless you believed in vain, to take that seriously means that it's possible we might believe in vain. In Colossians, Paul says, if you indeed continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting in your hope of the gospel, implying that it's possible that you might not continue in the faith. Or, as Paul says again in 2 Timothy 2, the saying is trustworthy, if we've died with him, we'll live with him. If we endure, we'll also reign with him allowing the possibility that we might not endure and might not reign with him. So these are the five articles of remonstrance from the year 1610. You can see that these also are a unified whole, that they have a central idea here that grace is cooperative and we then must cooperate in it. And you might notice they sound almost identical to the position put out by Augustine through Aquinas, through the Council of Trent, and what remains the Roman Catholic position, except that there's no mention of sacraments involved. This is a very Protestant version of Catholic soteriology. Now, we need to be very clear at this point about what is motivating this whole Arminian project. It's a much deeper concern that God is made into the cause of evil in the Reformed system. That is, if one buys into Calvinism, it sure looks like a deterministic system in which God is the cause not only of everything good, but also of evil in the world. Listen to R.C. Sproul, movement of every molecule, the action of every plant, the falling of every star, the choices of every volitional creature, all of these are subject to God's sovereign will. No maverick molecules run loose in the universe beyond the control of the creator. If such a molecule existed, it could be the critical fly in the eternal ointment. Everything is sovereignly under God's control in such a way that God has predestined and ordered everything under his control. It sounds like if everything is foreordained by God in that way, then so is evil. A key quote by Jonathan Edwards here gets at the problem at its center. Edwards says, if by author of sin, it's meant the permitter of sin, or not the hinderer of sin, I say, if that is what's meant by being the author of sin, then I don't deny that God is the author of sin. And this is the reason that Arminians are concerned. Now, Calvinists make a key distinction here between God's decreed will and God's permissive will. That is, God has decreed certain things to happen, and then God permits other things to happen. But the Arminian would ask, if this is the understanding of God's sovereignty, that there are no maverick molecules in the universe, and that God is the permitter of sin, that sounds very much like there's no real difference between God's decreed will and God's permissive will. And for the Arminian, that's the deep problem lying behind all of this. We might ask the question here, why did Adam sin in the first place? With Adam, there was no sin nature. And all Calvinists will say that God kind of pulled the plug on Adam and allowed him to fall into sin, withheld the grace that would allow him to do what was good so that he would end up sinning. And that, it seems to Arminians, is a key problem because it sounds like Adam's fall is one that God caused in a certain way. This leads directly into the problem of election. Remember, Calvinists claim that God elects some to salvation for his glory, that is, he shows them love, but then God passes over others and allows them to go to damnation. And they claim that's also for God's glory, to show his justice. Now, for Arminians, that sounds a bit absurd. Consider this example by Roger Olson who would believe that a teacher who withholds the information students need to pass a course merely permitted them to fail. What if that teacher, when called by parents and school officials, said, I didn't cause them to fail, they did it on their own. 
Would anyone accept that explanation? Or would they accuse the teacher of not merely permitting the students to fail, but also of actually causing them to fail? And what if the teacher argued that he or she actually planned and rendered the student's failure certain for a good reason? To uphold academic standards and to show what a great teacher he or she was by demonstrating how necessary his or her information is for students to pass. Would not these administrators only deepen everyone's conviction that the teacher is morally and professionally wrong? In our world of human existence, someone who acted in such a way as God does, they claim, would be a moral monster and not a loving God. Now, of course, the Calvinists have their own response. They would say, well, yes, I see the problem. But when you look at it, the Arminian position is not better in any way. God is not more loving in their understanding. Because both sides agree that God has chosen to save certain persons and not other persons. And they would say the difference is only one of emphasis. Is the priority on God's electing grace, as it is for the Reformed, or is the priority on free will, as it is for the Arminians? That is, God is very gracious by choosing some to salvation, and yet Arminians emphasize God is very gracious by allowing human beings to choose. Now, which one is actually better? Arminians hold it's more important to God to give people free will to decide their own destiny than it is to save everyone. So they would claim Arminians don't get one step closer to solving the problem. They simply push it back to human merit, and human merit is exactly where we don't want to go with the issue of salvation. And of course, the Reformed will also argue that Arminians don't really solve the problem of evil at all either. Because, after all, foreknowledge doesn't solve the problem. If God looks ahead and sees what will happen and ordains all things based on that, then the future is actually set anyway. Furthermore, even Arminians claim that God allows certain evil things to happen. And so, practically, they end up in the same place. The Reformed will argue that all persons distinguish between God's decreed will, what he establishes will happen, and God's permissive will, things that he allows to happen but are not according to his will because they're evil. And so, frankly, whether one is Calvinist or Arminian, the same problem still shows up. And they would argue that foreknowledge without ordination is the worst of all scenarios because mere foreknowledge without foreordination means that God does not have any larger purpose. If he simply looks ahead, sees what human beings will do, and responds to human beings, God should have a greater plan, something that he's moving all persons to and the whole world toward, and it's that gracious plan that makes God's grace so amazing. So Horton says, if God doesn't have any larger purpose, if he simply looks ahead, well then what incentive would there be to pray? Why would we think God cares or has ability to do anything in this world? Or knowledge without ordination would be a very disastrous thing, say the Calvinists. Well, the result of this unresolved and ongoing debate is two forms of Protestantism, a Reformed Calvinistic perspective and an Arminian perspective that emphasizes the free will of human beings and cooperative grace as God accomplishes his saving purposes in the world. Jacob Arminius died in the year 1609. The five articles of remonstrance were put out in the year 1610. And in 1618 and 1619, the reformed community in the Dutch regions pushed back with the articles and canons of Dort and condemned the Arminian position. And it would be over a hundred years until that Arminian position would flourish in a new way in the thought of John and Charles Wesley. John Wesley being that Oxford theologian who became a missionary in the United States. And Methodism has grown as a worldwide religion because of his effort.
So it's Wesley and Wesleyanism that become the standard bearer for Arminian theology as it moves forward to today.